2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise be to him. May God bless the reading and our hearing of his word. You may be seated. Pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for that message that you sent of reconciliation, that pathway. The only way to you is through Christ, and we are so grateful that you've done that. Not deserving, no merit on ourselves, but by your holy, sovereign, grace-filled nature, you provided a way. Lord, we love you for that. We praise and honor your name. Lord, I pray that we all continue to receive that message, that gospel message of salvation and being reconciled to you, just as these children are, that we would receive that faith like a child and grow in grace. Lord, I pray your blessings on the passage today, the message. Give Pastor Brandon all the clarity, the boldness, and give him joy in bringing that message to your flock. Lord, save. Today, save. We ask this in Christ's name, and all of God's people say, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you today. Lots of excitement in our service today. So first and foremost, normally exist in two services, but today we are in one, which I love. Uh, We don't necessarily have the capacity to do it every single week, but I love when we're able to do it because the worship is more powerful. Uh, I get to stand at the front and just hear all of the hundreds of voices uh, just echoing behind me singing the praise of the Lord, and it's a wonderful thing. It's also different because... um, If this is your first time with us, we don't normally have this much jungle theme around here. Uh, This is new for us. This is uh, this is our VBS theme. Our our theme was the jungle journey, and uh, this past week we went on a jungle journey. It was pretty awesome. Uh, So we had all kinds of dart frogs and pink dolphins and manatees. I mean, it was it was pretty awesome. And to be a part of that, I, I I can honestly tell you, it has so encouraged even my heart as a pastor to watch these little children sing God's truth, memorize God's word, and then live out their faith. It's been so, so, so very encouraging. Uh, This past week, uh, we had 135 kids here on campus every single night from 6 to 8 o'clock. They were moving around. They had lesson time and snack time and craft time and game time and all the different things. They were singing with with Gil, and and it was all an amazing week. And alongside those 135 kids, we had about 90 volunteers from our church that were serving alongside of them, making sure that they were getting from one place to another safely, ministering to your children. So there, there are some amazing volunteers, and I just think it'd be so appropriate right now for us to just thank those volunteers for all that they've done. Karen Lentz, our our children's ministry director, uh, has been working tirelessly to to produce and get ready for this VBS. Um, We started talking about this a year ago. We started praying about it a year ago. So uh, we've been praying for this moment for an entire year, uh, and it truly is 
and answered a prayer. Our campus has been buzzing with energy and life, and it's, it's awesome to see. But in and amongst that, all that energy and all that life, God was doing some great and mighty things here on this campus. This, uh, this past week on Tuesday night, uh, we know of at least one student who, after hearing the message, went home to his mom and she reported back to us that, that, uh, that he had a strong desire in his heart to make Jesus his Lord and Savior, and he did that this week. So God brought salvation to his church, and we praise God for that. And we know from God's word that, that not only does he bring salvation that way, but sometimes he plants seeds, and, and we know that as the gospel is preached, seeds were planted, some seeds were watered, and, and we will hopefully one day see those come to fruition in the lives of students. But we praise the Lord for that. And not only that, but we have this really cool palm tree over here with, with two monkeys. Uh, Pastor Sam and I represented, uh, one represented the boys team, one represented the girls team. Because uh, I'm a girl dad, uh, I was like, hey, I want to represent the boys for once in my life. So I said, I'm going to represent the boys. And uh, our monkey was named Clarence, and as you can see, Clarence did not beat Charlotte. He lost. So that meant that I had to receive a pie to my face, but thankfully, Pastor Sam was a good sport and got one as well, and the kids just erupted, and it was so much fun. Um, but, but behind all of that, was, that was our offering this, this week, and our children raised $1,500 in their offering money. Yeah, yeah, you could, you could praise the Lord for that. That's all the Lord. $1,500 to go with our missions team to Zambia. We have a missions team. Rob and Melissa Dunn and Louis Garamita are going to Zambia. I think tomorrow they're leaving. Like, I, I'm surprised Rob's even here, uh, but he's going to be on a plane for like, I think it's like 18 to 20 hours to fly to Zambia uh, with Lewis and his wife Melissa, uh, and they're going to be ministering to pastors there in Zambia, training them up, and, and the money that the students raised are going to go to a school that they're ministering in there in Zambia to purchase desks and chairs, and because we went above and beyond our goal, they're also going to be purchasing notebooks and supplies for the students, and that becomes a hub for the gospel message to go out. So those students that gave money, your children that dug through their, their piggy banks to bring in money, are helping the gospel advance around the world, and that is something we can praise the Lord for. It's amazing. I watched and, and I kind of talked to students as they brought their money in, and many of them said, this is my allowance. Uh, one student said, this is my tooth fairy money. She was missing her front tooth. I said, well, praise the Lord that he made you lose your tooth this week, right? <laughs> and, and, and there's all these students that brought their allowances, their tooth fairy money, their savings, and all of that sacrificial giving is helping the gospel go forth. So uh, our next capital campaign or building project, we're going to start in our children's ministry because they're pretty good uh, fundraisers. <laughs> But this week really had eternal significance in the lives of our children, but also the lives of the children all the way in Zambia. It had eternal significance around the globe, and it even had eternal significance in my life and many of the other leaders' lives as well. So, so we praise the Lord as we close out our amazing week of Vacation Bible School. And I want to focus in today on the theme verse that the kids memorized this week. I want to, I want to bring it to you, give you a, a mock VBS lesson that's a little bit, little bit longer and a little bit less illustrations and cool things happening because we're adults, right? We don't need that stuff. But the idea is that we want to focus on this passage. The, the verse that the, the children memorized this week was this. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The, the children applied this to memory. They're, they're hiding it in their hearts. And what we know to be true about God's truth is that when we hide it in our hearts, it's there forever. And God will recall it to our recollection at many different times. But this verse is extremely important. It's, it's extremely important because it highlights the life change that only Jesus can bring. It highlights the fact that there is, there is something that, that can happen in our lives that only Jesus can do. This verse described the life change that came to that little boy this week. This verse describes the, the lives that can be changed through the, the missions work that we're going to be doing in Zambia. This verse describes the life change that can even happen today. And we believe that here at Mill Creek Community Church. We believe that God is doing great and mighty things. So I want to take a quick detour 
uh, from our summer series. Uh, if you were to join us next week, uh, we're going to be in the Psalms. We're spending our whole summer in the Psalms, but we're going to take a detour this week to focus on the Vacation Bible School passage and to, to study it today. And our goal in doing that is this, is that, that you would be able to continue the conversations that your children are having as a result of VBS. That the VBS wouldn't just be a week and then it's done, but it would be something to be an ongoing conversation in your homes. Or, or maybe you're here today and you've never heard that verse before. Your kids came home and they're quoting it and you're like, where did you hear this? Like, what, what does this even mean? And, and you're here today and, and, and what I want to do is I want to show you why this is such an important verse for our focus this week at Vacation Bible School, but then also for our own lives as well. So I want to go ahead and read one more time our passage today. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A very powerful, very important passage that exists in a very important context. And what we like to do here at this church is to take scripture and to study it and to understand it and to exegete or bring the meaning out of the text for our lives today. And in order for us to do that, we need to understand the text in its original context. Who was Paul writing to as he wrote these words? What we know is that Paul was writing this to a church in Corinth. It was the Corinthian church, and as he wrote to this church, he's writing this particular letter. He wrote 1 Corinthians. This is his second letter that he writes to them, and the second letter he's writing to them is to defend his ministry and to defend the message of the gospel that he had been preaching. This whole, this whole book of the Bible is the defense of what God had called Paul to do in his ministry. See, there were false teachers in the Corinthian church who were raising up and saying, hey, this Paul guy who planted our church and then, and then wrote this letter to us, he, he's not a good guy. He's a bad guy. We shouldn't listen to him. He's preaching a false gospel. And they started to, to create an undercurrent in the church. And Paul writes to say, hey, this is the message that I preached to you. This is the message that God had given to me to preach to you. And specifically in chapter 5, Paul is specifically defending the message of the gospel. That term, the gospel, means good news. It means that, that Paul was preaching to them the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's going to show us today that the good news that he was preaching to them, the good news of 2 Corinthians, the good news of the Bible is this that we can be made new. So he starts by declaring that in verse 17. The declaration of this whole entire passage is this. You can be and you are made new. You are made new. Paul boldly declares that in verse 17, that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We have been made new. We all love new things. Right? It's why we love the, the newest release of the iPhone, the newest release of the video game we've been waiting for, the new book we've been waiting for. Whatever it is, we wait for it and we love new things. And Paul is saying that you can be made new. You don't have to wait for something else to be new. You can be new. The oldness of our lives, he, tell us, he tells us here, is, is gone. And, and God replaces that oldness with new life. And maybe, maybe you're here today and that message really appeals to your heart because you're like, you know, Pastor Brandon, I, I, feel, I feel old, right? I feel like, like there's just an oldness to my life. There's a staleness to my life. And, and I've been looking for something, whether it be weight loss or, or, or a health journey or, or some new hobby. I've been looking for something to invigorate new life into me. So you're telling me that God can give me new life? That appeals to me. That's where you're at today. I'm going to tell you that the new life that Paul tells us about is an amazing life. So we ask ourselves, what is the old life and what is the new life that Paul's talking about here? Well, he's talking about our natures. 
He says, as people, we exist in one of two natures. The first nature that we can exist in is our old nature, but Christ can give us a new nature. What we understand about our nature is this. We would define it as our capacity. Our nature is what our capacity is to do. In our old nature, our capacity is to sin. That's what we do. We sin. Our our capacity is built around sinning. But when God gives us a new nature, he gives us the capacity to resist sinning. He gives us a a new capacity to say no to sin. You see, what what Paul is saying is that, that every single person that's ever been born on the face of the earth was born with an old nature, and that old nature was a sin nature. That nature, we call it the old nature because it's old news. It's what we were born with. It's, it's the, the nature that existed from the very time that we took our first breath. We existed in sin. The Bible tells us that we get that sin nature. We inherit that sin nature from the very first sin that took place in the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They sinned against God, and that sin nature was carried through their offspring to the next offspring to the next offspring, and we all exist as sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned. All have sinned, every single person, myself included. There's nobody who's been immune to sin. We've all been sinners, and we're all living in an old nature. But the good news of this passage is that Paul declares that God can give us a new nature. God can give us something new. He can change the oldness of what we were born into into something that is new, a new nature, a new way of living, a new approach to life that, that, that we would even see life differently as a result of what God will do in our lives. As I said, this new way of living allows us to say no to sin. God empowers us in this new nature, in this new life, to say no to sin, something that we don't have the power or the capacity to do in our old nature. See, our old nature cannot be godly, but our new nature can be godly. God gives us 100% capacity to be godly because of what he does in our lives. Maybe you've been in church before, and you've heard it expressed in terms like, you must be born again. You're like, that sounds weird. I don't understand that. It just seems like an insider term. What it's saying is that you must be born again into a new nature, that you, you're, you were born in your old nature, your very first day of life on this earth, but, but God is saying you must be born again into a new nature, and that new nature is what I give to you. So naturally, this first verse, this declaration of verse 17 gives way to some very important and key questions in our lives. And I want to ask these four questions of our time today. These four questions are going to guide our time in God's Word. And as we ask these four questions, Paul's going to answer each of those four questions for us. The first question I want to ask of the text is this. How do I become new? How do I become new? So, so we're talking about newness, Pastor Brandon. Well, how do, I, how do I get this newness that you're talking about? W- what happens? I, I like all of that talk about newness, but, but how do I become new? And I want to show you in the text today how you become new. Because God shows us here through his word. He's, he's showing us how we become new. So, so I don't know if we can pull, can we pull the iPad up there? Is it up there? Oh, look at that. That's super cool. This is going to be really tech savvy today. So just hang on, Okay. What he says here in verse 18 is this. He says, all of this, I'm going to highlight that for you, all of this is from God. What is all of this? All of this is the fact that that we are a new creation and the new has come. What Paul is saying is that these are inextricably tied together, that the new creation and the fact that the new has come is all of the things that God is doing in our life. He says that all of this is from who? It's, It's from God. That God is the one who accomplishes the newness for us. God does it. God does the work to accomplish this for us. It's not something that we can do on our own. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I didn't create the new life. I I, I can't be the one who tells you to just do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll have this new life. No, there's not anything that we can do to make ourselves new. It's God's work for us. 
God does the work of salvation. He's the one that does the work of making us new. See, Paul didn't do it. He didn't do it by being a really good guy. He, he didn't do it by, by, by praying, by giving lots of money so that Clarence could beat Charlotte, which didn't happen, which I'm really bitter about still because I'm still smelling dairy on my face from the pie. But the idea is that, that Paul didn't become a new person because he gave money or he prayed or he said special words or he did special dances or he went special places. No, Paul became a new creation because God did it for him. God did the work. God was the one who was working in Paul to make him new. And God is the one who will do the work in you to make you new. Paul was transformed. We know Paul's story from reading scripture that that Paul was a religious murderer. He was on a murder path. He was going to go and kill Jews and kill people. He was going to kill people that were converting to Christianity. And on his, his war cry of killing people, God stopped him and made him a new creation called the road to Damascus. It's Paul's story about how God entered into his life and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? You need to follow me. And Paul changed that day because God did the work. And Paul, the guy who is killing people, becomes an evangelist who preaches the good news of what God did in his life to other people who get saved, and he plants a bunch of churches. That amazing transformation doesn't come out of a person's good nature. It comes only from God. Let me tell you a little bit about our church. I love our church so much. I love it so much because I get to hear the stories of the people that come to church here on a, on a weekly basis. And the stories of the people that are here are amazing stories of God's salvation. They, they, they're amazing stories of people who, who, who have been saved from drug addiction. We have people who have been saved out of gang life. We have, we have people who have been saved out of all different kinds of, uh, of evil pasts and lives that are here, that worship, that sing truth week in and week out, and they are an amazing testimony to the fact that God is the one who makes people new. God transforms them. God is mighty to save. No one, let me, t- let, me, let, me, let me let you hear this today, no one is too far gone for Jesus to save them. No one is. So I don't believe that, Pastor Friend. Well, come, set up a time and sit down with me, and I'll share story after story from Scripture and story after story from our congregation of people who thought that they were too far gone, but Jesus radically saved them. It's amazing. So the first thing we must grasp is that God does the work of making us new. It's not our work. It's God's work for us, which brings us to our second question. The second question is this. How does God actually make us new? What's the process here, Pastor Randy? How does God accomplish this great work that you're talking about? How did he make Paul a new person? How did he make that drug addict or that gang member a new person? How does God do that? When we go back to the iPad here, we we see this, that, that he does it in a very specific way. He says, all of this is from God who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself. He says that that God has an agent of what he's doing, and the agent of what he's doing is through Jesus Christ. Christ is the person who accomplishes the new work of your life. Christ does it for us. And Paul introduces this very important concept here, that, that, that God was using Jesus to accomplish the new life, and he's the only way that we can be made new. It's only Jesus. We say it a lot here. It's only Jesus. And Jesus said it was only him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I'm the only way. It's only the way that we can be made new is through Jesus. So what did Jesus do? Well, well, Paul tells us here. Paul says that, that, that Christ did something spectacular. He introduces his work here. He says that, that he reconciled us to himself, that Christ was reconciling us to himself. And he uses that word multiple times. Let me show you. He says he reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was 
reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Five different times in five verses, Paul says that it's reconciliation. We need to be reconciled. The way that we become new is that we are reconciled to God. See, the first rule of Bible study is this. Don't talk about Bible study. No, I'm just kidding. The first rule of Bible study is observation. Observe. What is the text saying? And specifically, one of the easiest methods of observation is what's repeated. Because if it's repeated a lot of times, it's probably an important concept. And five different times, Paul says that it's reconciliation, that we need to preach reconciliation, that we've been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation, and we're called to be reconciled to God. So that makes us ask the question of, well, what does reconciliation mean? The reconciliation defined is this way, the act of causing two people or groups of people to become friendly again after an argument or a disagreement. Reconciliation is restoring what has been broken. Reconciliation is a very important concept. To to help you understand a real-world idea and understanding of reconciliation, let's look at it this way. Reconciliation is the plot of every single Hallmark Christmas movie. (laughs) Just telling you. You want to see reconciliation on first-hand display? It's right there. Because what's going to happen is big city boy is going to show up to small town. He's going to be the small town girl with the small town bakery. She's going to bake really good sweets. He's going to fall in love with her. They're going to have really awkward banter, right? It's going to progress, and then something from his past is going to pop up, and she's going to get really upset. And they're going to have a break. And they're all going to stare in frosty mirrors and look and just think about each other until 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve when they come together and they kiss and everything's good. (laughs) I just ruined Christmas. That's reconciliation. It's the fact that they were, they were at odds and they were opposed to one another, but now they are restored. And that's the message of Scripture, is that, that in the very beginning, the very first and second chapter of God's Word, it tells us that we existed at odds with God because we existed in sin and we need to be restored to Him. That's the message of Scripture. That, that, that our relationship needs to be restored. That if, that if we need to be reconciled to God, then that means we exist in animosity with God prior to Jesus reconciling us. Reconciliation is born out of hostility between two things. There must be hostility in order for there to be reconciliation. So the fact that Paul's highlighting reconciliation here means that he's admonishing and understanding that there is hostility between us and God, and that hostility is a product of our sin. That hostility was born the day that we chose ourselves instead of God. What we taught our kids this week at VBS was was that sin is anything that we say, anything that we do, or anything that we think that goes against God. It's a very easy way to remember sin. Anything that we say, anything that we think, or anything that we do that goes against God, it means that we are living in opposition to God. We're creating animosity in our relationship with God. That's what our sin does. The Bible tells us that our sin makes us enemies of God. Romans 8, 7 says, Our old self, our old mind is set on the flesh. And our flesh is hostile towards God. The hostility, those words are enemy, warlike terms that say we are in opposition to God. Because God is perfect, because God does not have sin and we have sin, he cannot have a relationship with us. So are we just left to stare into frosty window panes and think about God? Or is there a way that we can be reconciled? It's bad news for our reconciliation plan that we have hostility. But, as we'll show you in the text, Christ 
does something amazing for us. And it tells us here in verse, in verse 18, it says, we are reconciled through Christ to himself, and he gave us a ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19, he says, that is in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself by doing what? It says, not, oh, let me, let me switch that. I knew that was going to happen. There it is. He says, not counting their trespasses against them. He says, that is how we are reconciled to God, is that God does not count our trespasses against us. God doesn't, God, God's able to look past our sin. And that begs the question, well, how does God do that? How does he look past our sin? It kind of sounds like, well, can God just turn a blind eye to our sin? And we might think maybe that's a good solution, and maybe that's what Paul's saying is that, that God just kind of like, okay, well, I see nothing. I just won't look at it. Just be really good people. But that's not a just solution. That might have been a good solution for you and your relationship, maybe with a, with a boyfriend or a, or a past spouse or, or with a friend or a coworker, is that you just kind of look the other way while they do something, and you can exist not in hostility if you just look the other way. But that's not how God can exist. God is too perfect to exist that way. Because if God existed that way, that would not be a just solution. See, God's justice will not allow him to turn and look and turn a blind eye towards sin. See, any judge, if there was a judge in Erie who was operating and saying, you know what, from time to time on Tuesdays, I'm just going to turn and, and say, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to not notice the sins that are in front of me. I'm just going to pardon people left and right. No, 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 don't tell me what you did. You're pardoned. I don't need to hear it. We look at that judge and say, that's a bad judge. They need to be thrown out. They're not just, they're not serving justice by turning a blind eye to the crimes that are happening in Erie. And what we know to be true and what, what the children learned this week at VBS is that God is a righteous judge. That means he's a perfect judge. That means that, that, that he is better than any human judge could ever be. He's better than the Supreme Court. He's better than any judge that we've ever known or voted for. God is a perfect judge. And his righteousness will not allow him to be blind towards our sin because sin is the antithesis to what he stands for. Well, Pastor Brandon, we got a problem. How does God not count our trespasses against us if he doesn't turn a blind eye? Well, well, what can he do? How can our sin be dealt with that we can be reconciled to God? And the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer, which brings us to our third question, which is this. What did Jesus do to reconcile us? What did Jesus do to reconcile us? And I'll jump back into the text here. I want to show you. It says right here in verse 21, I want to read it and and highlight it in a way that you'll be able to understand it. It says, for our sake, he, he being God the Father up here, he made him, which is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, which is Jesus, who the one, is the one who we're reconciled through, we might become the righteousness of who? Of God. It was God through Jesus. It was God making Jesus our sin. This is my absolute favorite verse in all the Bible. So my wife led the teaching time, so when she picked uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, I said, great, you should have picked 21. It's a good one. And she said, no, I'm always right. I said, you are always right, babe. No, that's not how it went. But, but 21 is my favorite verse, and here's why. Because it was my belief in this verse that changed my life. It was my belief that Jesus became my sin, that changed my direction of life, of what I became and what I did. It changed the dad I was. It changed the father or, or the husband I am. It changed the man I am. It changed the entire course of my life. See, without this verse, I would not even be a pastor, to be honest. My whole life is dedicated to the belief of this verse of what Jesus did. So what did Paul tell us that Jesus did? He became sin. He became sin. But notice what it says there. It didn't say that that he had sin. No, it says specifically in this verse, if we flip back to the iPad here, he says says that he knew no sin. There was no sin that there was even a knowledge or thought in his brain. There was no sin that could even permeate his life. He knew no sin. Sin. 
There was absolutely no sin inside of him ever. For the 33 years that he walked on this earth, he never got mad when someone cut him off on the way into Jerusalem. He never got mad when, when somebody took too long to order their food at the temple. He never got mad at, in those ways that were, would be a sinful anger. He never got mad and stole things. He never, he never did anything that was considered sin. He never did anything in opposition to God because he was God. And he could not act in opposition to himself. So then what does it mean that he became sin? Well, it means that Jesus, because he was perfect, did not deserve to die. Because the penalty for sin, the Bible tells us, for the penalty or the the payment, the wages of sin, is death. So Jesus didn't deserve to die, but newsflash, what do we celebrate every single Easter? Jesus died. Jesus died even though he didn't deserve to die. Well, well, how do we explain the juxtaposition that we find ourselves in? Well, well, he died willingly to take our punishment upon himself as an innocent man. And in doing that, Jesus became our punishment for sin. He didn't have to. He could have just went right back up to heaven and never died. And his death was violent and horrible. We we know that from from reading scripture. But he did that so that he could take the punishment for my sin and your sin and the sins of the whole entire world on himself and pay them in full. And that's very important for us to grasp. It's important for us to grasp because if Jesus didn't come to do that, there'd be no hope. No hope whatsoever. There'd be no hope because, because we couldn't be reconciled to God. Because what Paul tells us under the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says the only way that we can be reconciled is through Christ. Jesus had to come. He had to die in our place and for our sins. There would be no hope for us to be made new if Jesus didn't die. We would all be stuck in our old sinful nature, and we would all die apart from Christ. We'd all be guilty of our own sin, deserving of the punishment. So the good news here is that Jesus came to set us free from our sin, and it's his punishment. And notice what he does here. Go back to the verse. It says that even better news, he takes our sin, even though he knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. So he takes our sin, and he gives us something greater. And the greater thing that he gives us is his righteousness. I don't do a lot of car deals, but that's the greatest trade-in incentive ever. That'd be like you taking your old jalopy down to Bianchi and saying, hey, here's my old car. The head gasket's blown. It's one breath away from death. I want that brand new 2024 Sonata that's sitting at the end, or or a cool car. That's the only car I could think of, sorry. (laughs) I don't know why. But that's the car, that's not the car I want. Right? But, but, that, but I want that new car. I'm, I'm sure that the car salesman would be very nice with you and be like, it doesn't work that way. You have to pay something. The only place that that trade-in works where it says, take my old junkiness and give me something new, the only place that that works in our world and the universe is in Christ. Where he says, I will take all of your sinfulness, I'll take all of your your nasty past and everything, I'll take it upon myself, I'll pay it in full, and instead I'll give you my righteousness. Church, we don't even understand how great of a deal that is. That's a life-changing deal. And that new life that he gives, he says, he says, give me your old life. By surrendering to me, and I will give you a new life with a new nature that's built in my righteousness. That's where we get the power to be godly. It's from his righteousness that he gives to us. He declares it upon us. And this new life comes with that declaration of righteousness from God. It means that when God looks at us, when you stand before God someday, and and, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? And he looks at you, he doesn't see your drug addiction. He doesn't see your alcoholism. He doesn't see your violence. He doesn't see your stealing or your lying or your cheating or whatever it is. He doesn't see that, that if you are in Christ, when he looks at you, he only sees Christ standing in front of you. And he says, because of Christ, you can come in. 
That's the only way that we can be reconciled to God is that Jesus stands in between us and God and says, I paid for everything that he owes. And Jesus says, and God says, well done, good and faithful servant, come into my glory. The only way that we can be righteous is if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that he took the penalty for our sin on himself, and then he gave us, he declared upon us this perfect righteousness. Church, I can tell you with certainty, certainty, because the Bible tells me this, that one day we will all stand before God, and the only thing that will allow us into perfect heaven is the perfect righteousness of Jesus that he gave to us in exchange for our old life. It's the only way we can get there. If we try to just do our own good stuff, we can't do enough good to outweigh the bad because one bad sin makes us imperfect. And that was the heartbeat of VBS this past week. That was the message that permeated every single teaching time. This was the theme of the week, that if we surrender to Jesus... Well, then we can be made new, which brings us to our fourth question, which is this. What will your response be? What will your response be? Paul Paul gives us two responses in verse 20. He gives us two ways that we can respond to this call of being reconciled to God. And he describes two people here all throughout this passage. He describes a new person and an old person. And to be honest... These two categories make up the entire world. Either you are living in your old nature or you are living in your new nature. Either you are surrendered to God or you are not surrendered to God. And here at Mill Creek Community Church, this is how we choose to see the world. Either people are new and in Christ or they are old and in their sin. That's the only way. Those are the two distinctions that we see everybody. We don't see people according to color. We don't see people according to financial standing or nationality or ethnicity or music likes or whatever it is. The only way that we see people is whether they are in Christ or out of Christ. Because here at MCC, the most important designation that could ever be upon your life is whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. Because that's the one that will make sense for all of eternity. The reason why we choose to see the world that way is because That's the distinction that God gives us all throughout Scripture. We either know him and we are in him, or we don't know him and we are outside of him in our old deadness. Nothing else will matter at the end of your life. Let me tell you a quick story as I I wrap our time here. It's the story of the Titanic, right? Newsflash. It hit an iceberg, okay? I don't know if you knew that. Don't want to spoil the movie for you, okay? But the, the Titanic was this massive ship that everybody celebrated as being the greatest ship that ever existed. It sailed across the Atlantic, and I had to look that up because I almost said Pacific. It sailed across the Atlantic, and, and uh, in the course of its sailing, it struck an iceberg, and it sank. What we know is that some people survived and some people did not. And, and what happened in those days is they didn't have X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. They didn't have uh, truth media or whatever else you use. They didn't have social media. They didn't have... Fox News or CNN, they didn't have any news platforms. So they had a slow trickle of news of who survived and who didn't survive. So back in England, what they did is they constructed a massive chalkboard in the the, the harbor there. And on that massive chalkboard, they put a line down the middle and they put on one side saved and the other side lost. And every day as they heard reports of who was saved and who was lost, they would write their name on either category, and you could go down and find out what happened to your loved ones that were on that boat. You see, the interesting thing about the Titanic was this, was that it existed with all of these different extravagant classes. There was first class, and second class, and third class. There was coach, and then there was like the workers, and then there was like the captain, and there was all these different people that that they They delineated who was good and who was not. They delineated who was great and who was not. They did that on the ship. It was like a caste system built into the ship. But I can tell you, none of that mattered on that chalkboard. It didn't matter if you were first class. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. It didn't matter if you worked for the ship or you were were the highest grossing person on that ship. None of that mattered. The only thing that mattered about your life was whether you were in the saved category or the lost category. Those two categories defined these people's lives. 
That's why we believe that this is the most important distinction in our lives of if you are saved by Christ or you're lost in your old nature. So let me just close by talking about these two categories. The first category is saved. If you're here today and you're like, Pastor Brian, everything you're saying, that hits, hits me home. It's home in my heart because I, I do believe what you said about verse 21, that Christ became my sin, and because of that, I'm declared righteous. And if you are made new in Christ, you're people who believe all of this passage. You've surrendered your life to Christ. And if you've done that, then he's made you new, and your eternity is secure. So naturally, you can just sit back, put your feet up, and just rest because you're going to be going home to glory someday. Wrong. That's not what Paul says, and that's not what the Holy Spirit tells him to say. If we jump back into the text here, I want to show you exactly what he says here. He says, therefore, if that's true of you, because you are in Christ, he says what? We are ambassadors for Christ. He says we're ambassadors for Christ. If you have been made new, then you have a declaration in your life. You're new, and you're an ambassador for Christ. You represent him. That's what ambassadors do. They represent their country in a foreign country. And God says, you're an ambassador here on this earth. This earth is not your home. Your home is in heaven, but you represent eternal things on the earth. You're an ambassador for Christ. You represent me in this world. What we know to be true about ambassadors is that their job is a 24-7 job. They never stop being ambassadors. Not like, oh, ambassador now, take my hat off, go commit a bunch of crimes. Okay, now I'm back an ambassador. No, they're an ambassador all the time. And the same is true for you. If you are in Christ, you are an ambassador till the day that you die, representing Christ on this earth. Everywhere that you go, you never stop being an ambassador. Paul tells us how we're ambassadors. Jump back into the text here. He says you're ambassadors, and this is what you do. You've been given, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Not only did he give us the ministry of reconciliation, but jump down to verse 19. He says that he's entrusting us to the message of, of reconciliation. So as ambassadors, you're called to have a ministry of reconciliation and a message of reconciliation. Those are the two things that you do as an ambassador. You say, well, what does that mean? What's the ministry of reconciliation? What's the message of reconciliation? It's the gospel. It's that Jesus died in your place and for your sins, and then he rose again, and he's ruling and reigning in heaven, and because of that, that's the only way that you can be reconciled to God. Then your ministry is to proclaim that, Your ministry is to proclaim that message of how other people can be made new. And that's what we're called to do. To be a good ambassador means that you participate in this ministry. It means that your life centers on representing the gospel. That you should never not be representing the gospel to your coworkers, to the people that are around you, to the, to the, to, as a father, as a mother, that this is what you should be representing. If you walk out these doors to go to our family fun day after this, on the left-hand side, I don't know if it's covered by vines, but if it is, we should rip them down. Because behind that is the greatest statement that defines this church. It's that the gospel changes everything. That's what we believe here. You want to be a different person? Start reading the gospel and understanding it and applying it to your life and let it change your life. It'll change the husband that you are, the father that you are, the mother that you are, the coworker that you are, the boss that you are. If you've got a bad boss and you want to make him a better boss, bring him to church because the gospel will change everything. We believe it. The Bible preaches it. It's what we stand on here. Don't let the good news of your life, the fact that you are old and dead, And now that you're new and alive, be something that you do not put on full display. Be an ambassador for Christ. As the worship team comes to close our time, the second category that you can find yourself in is the category of the lost. If you're here today and you've never, ever surrendered your life to Christ, then the declaration is not that you are made new, but that you are still old. You're still old. But the good news is that today can be the day that you are made new. Today can be the day that you start living out the new new life that Jesus has so radically won for you. Because if you were to die today in your oldness, then you'd be guilty of all of your sin. But if you were to die today in your new life, then Christ's righteousness stands in your place and for your sin. Paul says this in this passage. He 
He says the other thing is we're ambassadors if we know Christ, but then he says this, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He says we implore you, implore you. The idea is there's urgency, there's priority. With every fiber of Paul's being, he says, we implore you to be reconciled to God. My cry for you today is if you are still in your old way, if you say, I've never surrendered to Jesus, I've never saw him as taking my place in my sin, I've never saw him as the only way, I've been trying to do it on my own, but you're telling me I need to trust him, if that's where you're at today, then I implore you, be reconciled to God. And the way that you're reconciled to God is, is this. This is the most important decision that you'll ever make. You can pray this passage. You don't have to have special words. Just pray these words back to God, and it can sound exactly like this. God, I know that I am sinful, and I am stuck in my old ways, because verse 17 tells me that. I want to be new, and I can't do it. Verse 18 tells me that. I need you to do it for me. God, thank you for sending Jesus to become sin for me in verse 21 even though he was without sin, I want to be made new and to follow you for all of my days. I'm telling you, if you pray that prayer, if you pray this passage, God, make me new by putting my faith and trust in you, God will save you. And he'll save you radically. We want you to know, we want you to know that that is the most important thing. And I want you to know, too, if that is the decision that you make here today, that's not a solo mission. It's not that you just go and figure that out on your own now. No, no, no. That's why we exist as a church, to walk with you, to pray with you, to encourage you, to help you grow, to study God's word with you so that now you can make the next right step and the next right step and you can start progressing in this new life because you're a baby. You've been born again. You don't know how to walk. Somebody has to help you walk and grow up into maturity. And that's where we come as a church like MCC to help you do that through our community groups and our discipleship groups. So let us know if that's the decision that you make today, we want to walk with you. And today you can make that decision. You can make it right where you sit. There's nothing special about coming down front here. You can come down front if you want. It's, it's a great place. The pastors can come and pray for you, pray with you, and help encourage you. But you can make that decision right where you're at. There's nothing significant about the front of a church the significant thing is the decision that we make to surrender to Jesus. Don't leave here today an enemy to God, dead in your sin. Leave here today reconciled to him as a new creation. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it guides us, that it shapes us, and that it molds us. God, we thank you that, that you gave us this truth you gave our children this truth this week so that, that we could understand that you make all things new. God, that truth should well up inside of our hearts and cause us to be so happy and joyful that there should be joy in this house that you created. There should be joy in the house of the Lord because you made us new. So guys, we're going to sing in just a moment. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Let us sing with hearts that have been made new, that there's joy in our lives because you've reconciled us to you through your son, Jesus. But God, I understand that this might not be a house that is full of joy, but there might be somebody here today who's wrestling with their old nature. God, I pray today would be the day that they surrender to you. They'd stop living in the old dead ways that they were born in, but that, God, that they would take a new step to walk in the newness of life that you've won for them. God, I pray that they'd surrender to you so they can walk in godliness and walk in the joy of the Lord. God, we thank you for the great work of salvation that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us this morning? There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Cause we were.
were the beggars. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Amen, church. Well, we are so excited, and in that spirit of joy, we invite you all right out these doors here. Uh, we have inflatables, we have pizza, we're celebrating the end of VBS, celebrating the fact that we have lots of new people visiting with us. You can go right out here, it's a family fun day. There's all kinds of things for your family to do, all kinds of fun events. We invite you to stay, to eat, to participate, to jump on the bounce houses, to run through the obstacle courses, be a kid again. It's great. That is the good news. One note of bad news. And this is uh, for our church family here. We are truly a family, so it's always sad when a family of our church uh, leaves and moves away. And uh, we're going to be losing a very key and loving family that's going to be moving to Texas because they want to be closer to grandkids. Who wants to do that? <laughs> Somebody raise their hand. <laughs> All right, I got a witness back here. But we're going to be losing Chris and Tracy Berger. They're leaving for great reasons. They're going to, to love and minister to their, their grandchildren and their children. They're going to be moving to Texas, which is a cool place. They, they love Jesus. They love guns there, which is cool, right? Um, but they're going to be moving there. So this is their last Sunday with us. So MCC family, love on them well. We threw a big party for you guys out here. I don't know if you knew that. So. But we will miss you uh, terribly. And as we always say here at Mill Creek Community Church, as we're fed with God's word, we send you out as people to go love God, love others, and to make disciples. You're dismissed. Enjoy the family fun day. Well, we thank you for the victory tonight, Lord. Yeah. No more chains, chains on me. I'm gonna live in your victory. Once was blind, now I
First, you have to believe that you are a sinner. There is nothing that you can do to get to God on your own. And then number two, you believe exactly what Jesus said. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When you believe in Jesus, God no longer sees you and your sin. He just sees Jesus and his sacrifice, and that's pretty powerful.